so yeah uh, i think uh, in this experience that we've we have had as a as a, as an organization i think one of the main things is that uh, we have worked across technology so what was useful in 2016 might not even be popular today or might not even be the go to technology today because this this thing moves really fast like um if we look at how we used to just build web apps right like a couple of years or like like 3 years ago and how we make web apps today there's there's there's, there's a drastic difference if you look at the code maybe on on the on the overall years like i'm still using the same tech basically but the tech itself has completely evolved um the patterns have completely evolved um the arguments that you used to have on twitter have completely evolved into something else so um <laughs> let's let let's go into that okay um okay let's see what's what's right now working for modern web i think i, I think one of the things that are really that's really standing out right now is the fact that we're not just related to a platform as of now uh it's it's completely gone platform agnostic every tech that you see has some or the other support coming up for building some sort of universal applications i know the word universal applications is used a lot and actually if you implement it you do realize we don't yet have a very universal solution because at the end of the day you do have to separate it out for your web or for your native components when you actually start building out production grade applications right um but the idea is that if the underlying api has a good has a good enough support then it does leave it, it does give the developer a lot of leeway on to build whatever you want on top of it um i think one of the things that's popular with universal applications has been expo expo has recently pushed a lot of this narrative uh, about building universal applications um and and actually if you if you try also expo recently had a release uh, which was expo 50 um if you look at expo 50 they actually have a very nice underlying layer i mean it's it's a new thing so obviously you don't have a whole bunch of community stuff that's built on top of it but the underlying api that they provide and the kind of support that they're providing is is pretty solid to build off of and then obviously there there are like scope for improvement but I think one of the major things that Expo picked up off was the Metro support. So Metro is, um, I, I don't know how many of you have used React Native, but if you have used React or React Native, you must have encountered Metro. It's a it's it's a bundler, um, like Webpack for web, right? I mean, most of you must have used Webpack if you have dealt with front end technologies. Um, so Metro basically had support for React Native, uh, but they've extended it to build web. projects as well uh, and expo has leveraged that basically into their own build uh, so moving on from expo 50 you can build actually universal applications you can still use the whole dot uh, web files and the dot native files and to to address some specific you know use cases that you might have but on the on the overall you do have the folder structure which is very similar to how next js provides it right so there's there's also that if you want to really port your app into next so for example two months down the line it's not working out for you go ahead and copy the whole folder back into next it follows the exact same folder structure you won't find a lot of problems obviously you'll have to spend a couple of days on it to you know get it up and ready but it's not a there's not a lot of friction at this point earlier there there was for sure for sure um one of the other thing is micro frontends micro frontends have been popular for a while now uh, it feels repetitive saying it again and again but I think with the latest webpack release that happened around 3 years ago they they really streamlined it uh module federation has also played a big part um and as and as and when we move to higher and more complex production grade applications that we are building with react and this framework that we use mostly um micro frontends do start to make sense because simply because your 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 app is just getting too too huge to deal with um So I I think related to webpacks and micro frontends, there's there's also a trend of uh, companies moving back to mono repos, which I've seen. Um, they've started leveraging um, Yarn workspaces and a bunch of things to basically 
use mono repos but handle them separately which is sort of like uh, what you do with micro front ends but uh, the micro front end architecture with webpack is a, is completely different than that so uh, you do have benefits and um, you know constraints with both the approaches um, graphql has also seen a, a a decent rise in the last 3 years i think uh, we've we've built a bunch of production grade graphql applications here at geeky and uh geekians and 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 it, it's working really fine for us and i think that's what has pushed us also to to basically maintain a low state like when i say a low state uh, i mean to say when we started off probably in, i'm talking about 2017 18 and that time i think redux was very popular as a storage uh, as a as a state storage mechanism and people used to just abuse it and have like a really bloated state uh, i think i think having just the fields that you need with graphql has also prompted us to have a very lightweight state that has also coincided with the rise of uh, state management solutions like zustlin that we have right now um uh, it's a hook based very lightweight uh, state mechanism and a bunch of like the successors of redux as well like the toolkit and mobux uh, so so that's also something that has i think we are moving in that direction that if your api call needs to populate a certain component let that data just be ingested to that component just don't you know abuse your whole state for that um just a few things um the server components and route handlers i missed the top one um obviously with next js and next js acquisition of turbo and a bunch of things that have happened there a server has been brought to the front end devs so go ahead as soon as you open your application you you have your server files you can go ahead and reduce the gap reduce the friction that you have it's no longer that i'm just waiting for my backend developer don't do that you can go ahead and build the whole uh, the whole thing inside of your next app for example right um you can now build route you can now have route handlers you can now have route middlewares as well before you uh, change route so there's been really a lot of support i think there's yet to be huge community support for it because but that's only because these things are relatively new give it a year or so and i think we'll have like a whole ecosystem around that um okay uh let's move from modern modern web and okay ai has been like the buzzword recently right everything's ai everything's ai but what exactly are we doing with it right um one of the first thing that we do is that we leverage uh, gen ai a lot in supercharging our applications so be it like chatbots be it like um you know assisted uh, assisted help markups that pop up on websites basically um so th- we can really use it to to supercharge our app so that uh, we don't miss out basically on on technologies that other applications will obviously take 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 notice right uh prompt engineering is another new thing that has come up recently with chatgpt as well um it's pretty useful in making sure that your chatbots or the things that you integrate into your applications they do provide contextual meaning to the queries uh, and just not um static responses um ai assisted voice support has also gained a lot of traction um this has mainly worked in uh in the customer industry most mostly but it has expanded to other other areas as well i think we have a, got a couple of experiments also running in geekians um vasuki i think one of our leads is taking care of that and that's also if you follow our social handles you will get to know um we've also dealt with some real world examples with our inaus gpu we've got a inaus gpu um we can run large language models on it uh, and we have tried out a bunch of things so that how we get to know actually how it's working under the hood um that's that's really helped us a lot as well uh, again if you follow the social handles you'll get to know about that as well um okay regarding how we have actually used it you you can go ahead to blog.geekians you'll find a couple of blogs uh, and more content that's coming up around it um basically the idea is that when the clients or any anybody who wants to make an app they try to contact us and we have a discussion around them um generative ai does pop up 100% uh, so i think regarding business modernization it is it's obviously one of the go to features as of now nobody is building an app that's uh that does not leverage it in one way or the other so uh 
go ahead have a have a look at that um we also have a, a guide on how to build ai chatbots integrate them into your website get them up and running uh so go ahead and have a look at that as well um okay enough 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 me talking i think uh we've got some speakers here today uh vedant is here to talk about uh ai generating components for us is the co-founder at code pirate uh we've got veena who's a tech consultant she'll talk about safeguarding web development um we've got a couple of enough speakers as well we've got dinesh who will explore the intersection of web and gen ai and sort of is going to question um raise some questions about traditional search let's say so yeah 